But we begin this hour with a deadly insider attack in Afghanistan. One American soldier killed. Two others were wounded after an Afghan soldier opened fire on NATO forces. Welcome, everybody. Brand new hour starts now in America's newsroom. Glad to have you with us today. I'm Martha McCallum. And I'm Bill Hemmer. Good morning. It happened earlier today at a local government compound in the town of Jalalabad. The shooter killed on the spot by U.S. soldiers. Connor Powell picks up our coverage live in the Middle East Bureau. And what happened there, Connor? Well, Bill, details are limited, but we do know that a group of Americans, both from the State Department, from the embassy in Kabul, and also from the U.S. military, were meeting with this provincial governor in Jalalabad at his compound. And right after the meeting concluded, the uh, uh, embassy officials apparently left via helicopter. That's when an Afghan soldier opened fire. He killed one U.S. soldier, injured two others, and injured several other Afghan soldiers. The lone attacker was reportedly killed, but why he did this is very much unclear. Now, these types of attacks, unfortunately, Bill, are all too common to uh, U.S. and international troops in Afghanistan. Is there any confirmation whether or not the shooter, the Afghan shooter, has a connection to the Taliban? Well, U.S. officials say this is under uh, investigation, but these types of insider or green on blue attacks have happened pretty regularly in Afghanistan, although this is only the second time this year. Forty-four uh, international troops were killed by Afghan troops back in 2012. A lot of times the Taliban does take credit for these attacks, but not all the time are they actually connected to uh, the Taliban. A lot of times these are disgruntled Afghan soldiers. The Afghan military has improved significantly in recent years, but corruption and there are a lot of problems still remaining with the Afghan security forces. Right now, the most that U.S. officials can say is it's under investigation. They don't know if this was a lone wolf attacker or somebody who had sort of ties to the Taliban. It is an, a true insurgent, Bill. All right, Connor Powell, thank you on that breaking news from our Middle East Bureau. Let's bring in Prime Minister Netanyahu. Netanyahu's uh, spokesman, Mark Regev, is joining us live from Jerusalem. Uh, you want to react to what we just heard from the president saying it's unrealistic to think Iran is going to stop calling for Israel's destruction as part of this proposed nuclear framework agreement? The bottom line is this, Wolf. Uh, a normal country doesn't call for the destruction of one of its neighbors. It just doesn't happen in the world that we live in. And if Iran wants to be considered a normal country and, and treated in a normal way, they have to start acting like a normal country. And that means that they have to stop exporting terrorism around the world. It means they have to su stop supporting aggression in the Middle East. As you know, they're in Iraq, they're in Syria, they're in Lebanon, and now they're in Yemen. And of course, they have to recognize my country's right to exist, which is a very basic thing uh, to ask. The Prime Minister raised this issue already in his speech in Washington in the Congress, you'll recall, and he said the restrictions on Iran should only be lifted, only be lifted when there's a fundamental change in Iranian behavior. The uh, President was very clear in his interview with Tom Friedman of the New York Times over the weekend that he's pained by the accusations in Israel, elsewhere, in the American Jewish community, at least in some quarters, that he's supposedly anti-Israel. Listen to President Obama in that interview with the New York Times. It has been personally difficult for me uh, to hear uh, the sort of expressions that somehow um, we don't have, this administration has not done everything it could uh, to look out for uh, Israel's interests and the suggestion that when we have uh, 
very serious policy differences, uh, that that's not, um, uh, you know, in the context of a deep and abiding friendship uh, and, and concern and understanding of the threats that uh, the Jewish people uh, have faced historically and continue to face. That's something that I feel deeply and I feel personally and, and will continue to do so. All right, so here's the question. Do you think the President of the United States is anti-Israel? Listen, Israel and the United States are allies. We're friends. And I don't think anyone questions the motives of, of President Obama. We have the respect for him, as my Prime Minister said, the respect for him and for the great office he holds. But there is a serious policy difference, a very serious policy difference on this, on this Iran deal. And we see the framework that was negotiated in Luzon as being a real threat to this country, of being a real danger. Meantime, while much of the world focuses on Iran's nuclear program, Pakistan's nuclear arsenal is growing. And that's a topic for our national security correspondent, Jennifer Griffin, who's live from the Pentagon with more. Jennifer? That's right, Jenna. All eyes have been on the nuclear talks with Iran, but some non-proliferation experts have worried that the Sunni Arab nations in the Middle East may already be reaching out to the South Asian country that already has the bomb. Pakistan, the world's second largest Muslim nation, has an estimated 120 nuclear weapons. Last month, it garnered the world's attention by test firing a ballistic missile capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. Its range, 1,700 miles, named the Shaheen Three, it is capable of reaching all of India and far into the Middle East. As negotiations with Iran entered their final stage two weeks ago, Pakistan's prime minister made a high-profile visit to the Saudi capital, Riyadh, and also met with the president of Egypt, both of whom are concerned about checking Iran's expanding power. The assumption here is that uh, if Iran uh, achieve some level of nuclear status, Saudi Arabia will turn to Pakistan and say, can you help us out? Pakistan went nuclear, went nuclear testing its first atomic weapon in 1998. It has the world's fastest growing nuclear arsenal and has not signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT. Pakistan's top nuclear scientist, A.Q. Khan, set up an international nuclear bazaar in the 1990s. Pakistanis are widely believed to have provided uh, some of that nuclear expertise to the Iranians, uh, if not some of the material itself. And so what it looks like now as the Pakistanis have got involved in trying to counter the Iranian threat is it, it really looks like they're both the arsonist and the firefighter. In fact, Iran's foreign minister, fresh out of the nuclear talks with Washington, arrived in Islamabad today with a 21-person Iranian delegation purportedly to talk about concerns that Pakistan has offered to, to sell conventional weapons to Saudi Arabia for use against the Houthis in Yemen. What seems to be apparent, Jenna, is that Islamabad is positioning itself as a mediator in the complicated Middle East. Jenna. Very important for us to continue to watch. Jennifer, thank a you. Jury has found Found Jokar Sarnayev guilty of conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction and 29 other crimes related to the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing. The same jury will now prepare to hear a second round of evidence in the penalty phase. They could sentence him to death or life in prison. Sarnayev was accused of killing three people and injuring 264 by setting off a pair of homemade pressure cooker bombs at the race's finish line. The guilty verdicts follow 16 days of testimony, where in closing arguments, defense attorneys admitted Sarnayev's responsibility. But they contended that his older brother Tamerlan was a driving force behind the attack. Prosecutors argued Sarnayev was an equal partner with his brother in plotting the bombings as vengeance for U.S. military campaigns in Muslim countries.